for the second keynote of the day on the opportunities and risks of the Internet of Things. And in a moment, I will be inviting the, um, the speaker, and he is the international chairman of the Joint ISO and IEC subcommittee, responsible for the elaboration of software and systems engineering standards since 1997. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and a Computer Society Golden Core member of the same institute. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Francois Coalier. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure and honor for me to be able to uh, present to you here in uh, Malaysia. Uh, it's uh, only my second trip to your country. My first one was when I was much, much younger, uh, many years ago. And I can see that uh, your country has changed uh, quite a lot. And, they, and it's now a very different place. So I will talk to you about the Internet of Things, uh, about the opportunity and risk, and I'll put in small character there a system engineering perspective because uh, I view myself these days more as a system engineer, not as an expert in IoT. And uh, what's a bit special about this presentation is uh, initially I was approached by a member of the insurance industry and asked to present at uh, their conference, and you know the insurance industry is very complex, and then uh, somebody that from another association was there and asked me to present again. So the presentation itself uh, will be probably on the light side for those of you who like very technical presentation. I added more stuff uh, for this uh, presentation and made some modification, but simply to warn you that the approach may be a bit different than what you see. And it started when I had to talk with those people. Don't forget, these are non-technical people, non-IT. So I had to talk with a bit of history about IT. And IT has a very long history if you look at it from a very general point of view. We humans, as we evolve, and you can see this is a standard drawing, at a certain point in time, we started to use tools. And uh, the more people are making research, uh, the more they find that the way those tools influence also our evolution. And there was a kind of feedback. And it started a long time ago. Now the oldest stone tools that were found are 3.3 million years ago. And then the style evolved through time as well as our we evolve. And then at a certain point in time, another type of, uh, I would say, IT appear, which is art. Now, uh, this slide is a bit out to, out of date. The oldest art form that was found a statue is 70,000 years old in South Africa, which means that we humans were about the same from a skeleton point of view for about 200,000 years. Uh, something changed probably in the neural net we have in there uh, 70,000 years ago. And now what's a bit special between that and IT? Tools are complex to build, put together. How do you transmit the knowledge from one individual to the other about how to make those tools as they get more complex and at a point in time, art? You need speech. And again, uh, the evolution of speech was tied up to this. And then, as you can see, tools became more complex and IT came in. Now, in this chart, the guy who made that tried to put a very holistic view about the evolution of information technology. And uh, the chart itself, I should maybe redo it as a bit of, uh, is out of date. So oral language is probably two million years old, first form of IT. Uh, if you look at graphic arts, 70,000 years old. Uh, written language, it's interesting. Written language was invite, uh, was, uh, the oldest written language was made by whom? Accountants, as a way to be able to track inventory and collect taxes. And this was in the 36th century BC in Mesopotamia, and then it was invented in other places also. 
So uh, accounting, uh, data processing. Uh, and then uh, the oldest uh, mechanical computer, we'll come back to that. Uh, again, uh, the oldest machine that was found, an analog machine, is the uh, 6th century BC, Greek. So, coming back now to more immediate modern IT, what you have there is an evolution uh, that's showing waves of technology. And those waves of technology, if you look at the right hand center, uh, are coupled to a logarithmic increase of users. I mean, IT initially was the privilege of a few users, a few programmers, large data center. And as the PC came in, then the internet, uh, then as came in the uh, age of uh, mobile computing, the number of users went up significantly, which means a bigger market. And what was behind this evolution is, again, excuse me, the French name there is the law, Moore's law. Moore's law means that not only that the computing uh, density of computing resource was increasing, but the cost was going down at the same time. And this created a virtual cycle that made that in IT, things cost less with time and get more powerful. Now, uh, we're reaching a point where Moore's law is slowing down and getting more difficult. Already a few years ago, as you know, uh, you stop it saying that uh, you got uh, processing power was uh, in uh, clock rate because there was a uh, problem to dissipate heat. Architecture started to keep in, new architecture, multi-core, and now it's new material coming in. Uh, if we look at Moore's law, again, the big picture, starting from a mechanical era, we don't know where it will go. Change of technology, at least the person behind this diagram was very, was viewing computing power uh, reaching the capacity of the human mind at one place. Uh, we know that we have uh, quantum computing that's still in research stage. At least there's one company selling quantum computer uh, in Canada. And uh, these computers, there's a debate whether how much they are using uh, quantum computing or not. Now, back to again our timeline and uh, coming up to what's the main uh, point of this presentation. In the early 60s, uh, when the age of big data center, what you had is the first embedded system, which means that the IT, computing and software, was embedded into a system that had another function. And the first embedded system, at least, that we talked about was the Apollo navigation system in the early 60s. Nowadays, embedded systems, much more complex. If you look now at the car, a modern car, and this is not even an iron card, you have a lot of computing power that's distributed through a car, and also uh, link it together by different type of bus and computing device. And we had all those days the elevators that are now hooked into centralized system, call it industrial domotics, uh, that are embedded. And again, uh, as a software testers, I hope you trust the elevators when you take them. <laughs> Going further, uh, next step, uh, started talking about the ubiquity of computing. IT is everywhere and invisible in our economy, in our infrastructure, in the object that we use. This was already talked to it in the 90s. Next step in the evolution, we have mobile computing. And don't forget uh, that the iPhone came out in 2007, still nine years ago. And uh, you, what the impact of mobile computing, you had this uh, economist issue that was talking about uh, that uh, by 2020, 80% of adults in the world will have a supercomputer in their pocket. Don't forget that these things, it's just at least a supercomputer of the 70s, if not the early 80s. And we have that in our pockets. What do we do with this computing power? A lot of things, and we can do even more. Then the internet. Internet, as you know, the ancestor, 
started in the 60s, a research network, ARPANET. At a point in time, you had the World Wide Web. And then you have something that happened. What you have there is a representation of the internet. And as you can see, look like a cloud. And in a sense, internet plus services is cloud computing. You view the internet not as a network, as a source of service. A lot of different services. And cloud computing and mobile computing have co-evolved together. Think about the number of applications you have on your portable smartphone that use resource in the cloud. There's a lot. And it's feeding one another. So we're talking there again about co-evolution of technologies. As we move through time, now we talk about the Internet of Things. What's different? I mean, it's a lot of the things that I talk about, but the difference there is first that the object, the things, a lot of them are smart. We'll talk more about that. Then you have the key thing, you interconnect them through the network. They're connected to the cloud, and there's some value added coming out of that, of this integration. And we're talking about a lot of different type of object, a lot of different application, all interconnected. So communication, you can talk, but medical device, industrial, what they call the industrial internet, vehicles, and not only car, but uh, everything that's moving around. And then you have all the uh, e-commerce area that's changing with this. And it's covering a lot of application domain. You talk about an horizontal technology that touch a lot of domain, can have a lot of impact, potentially it's IoT. And I won't go through all of that. I mean, the energy, consumer, we talk vehicle, industrial, transportation, health industry, and I can go on. All have EIT, as a, will have, or has already an impact in all those areas. So very promising technology. Uh, technology that can be fully leveraged uh, through integration. And uh, this a company called Cisco, I mean, you know IT company are very good marketing-wise, talk about the internet of everything, but there's something right behind it because you have the things interconnect, those things generate a lot of data. Data is worthless if you don't do something with it. So you're starting now to talk about big data because there's a lot of this data, various changing in time, real time, and you need to get process it. And what do you do with this data? It will influence process. And you always have the people that are in the pictures because they're part of those process, those business process and other processes. And again, Cisco, but they may be right, talking about 50 billion device in the world that are interconnected by 2020. And 2020 is not far away. I mean, we're at the end of 2016 already. Now, another bus thing that's coming in is smart. You know, at the end of the 90s, you wanted to start a company, you will put E in front of whatever you want to do. So now you put smart. Smart, and you can see there, Again, this view about a smart wall world. So you have smart building. You'll have a smart power station. You'll have a smart utilities. And you can go on again, the smart home. Uh, you'll have a smart coffee machine, whatever. So smartness. Smartness, smart device that talk to one another. Now, smart things, some of them can become autonomous. So you're talking there about system that uh, perform task or behavior with a high level of autonomy. And it's been around for a while, this autonomy or semi-autonomy of uh, things. Uh, so uh, if you take for, if you look at an airplane and you fly an airplane, I mean, airplanes have been semi-autonomous for a while and even part of the flight are fully autonomous. Apparently even the autonomous pilot is more reliable than the human pilot doesn't make you a pilot's error. And uh, you're talking about autonomous car, but uh, again, uh, you have now autonom a lot of autonomous system uh, in farms where you're, it's a bit less complex to introduce these things. And myself, uh, simply for academic reason, I bought a new camera that's uh, fly. 
a semi-autonomous drone, and I could not pilot it if it was not semi-autonomous. So a lot of these systems are already around us, and more of them will come in, which is very useful. Now, Internet of Things is not the end of everything. There's something else that's over on top of that. And I'm saying that to tease all those people in the IoT area, but we're talking about ambient computing, ambient intelligence, which is, I would say, another layer on top. Talking about, again, an environment that is sensitive and responsive to event people. So there was this paper in IEEE Spectrum a while ago that make a bit of fun out of that. So it's meaning what? Uh, it's meaning you approach an interface, a, a surface, and poof, you have a screen and a keyboard that will appear. Uh, you are, let's say that you're on a diet and you have this application on your smartphone and you want to go to a McDonald's. And then you have this little voice that tells you, do you really want to go there? <laughs> It's a bit of ambient intelligence, and it's feasible, what I'm telling you nowadays. You can think about the the, all the cloud services that will be used in this app to do that. So in a sense, uh, and then it can go much further to the way you have uh, ambient overload, You're ta we're talking about an environment that's really embedded with IT, with intelligence, reacting to events, to people, to what you're doing, potentially. And it's not science fiction we're talking about. It's feasible. What you need to do that is a high degree of system integration. Where is it? Uh, now, I'm a, an academic, so I cannot afford to have a subscription to Gartner. I take what's available on the web. In 2014, the Internet of Things was put as the peak, of uh, again, of inflated expectation. You know? The hype cycle of Gartner is, is still reflecting what you have in IT. You have emerging technologies, and at a certain point in time, people start talking about it. Start to say it's the, late, the nicest invention since the world will have a big impact. It will replace everything. Uh, please put money into my company so that uh, we'll do and uh, you'll become rich. Uh, this is called hype. And we have a lot of it. And us in IT, sometimes we have to live with that because you have all those vendors that may go and sell their stuff uh, to people that don't understand really. And then at the point in time, reality come in. And it's not that the technology is bad, but there are some practical issues that are required to implement it. Practical issue like standards, uh, practical issue like some other technology that may complement it that's not there etc. And after a while, talk about it. Oh, it's bad. It was oversold before the market pick up. So Internet of Things in 2014 was put at the peak of hype. And then at the recent, uh, they put the change a bit the way they call it. They put the platform as below hype, a little nuance from Gartner. But w when you want to look at the picture itself, it's a bit more complex. This is an hype cycle about the Internet of Things. And what you see there is that there's a lot of Internet of Things, a lot of aspect to it, and a lot of application. And depending what you're talking about, it will be at a different point in the hype cycle. In some application domain, a certain level of technology of IoT is already mainstream. In others, it's still emerging. And in others, you still need standards to get it out. So when we talk Internet of Things, when we talk about the market, the maturity, that we have to be more precise about what we talk about because in many areas, many industries, it's there. In others, it's not there. It's not at its full potential. Now, one of the challenges I mentioned, there are two challenges. Standardization is required to be able to get the market to develop it fully. And also, because if you bought IoT's device for your own, like I did, I have a lot of series of different apps to deal with it because there's no system integration. And then in some case, when we talk about application like smart cities, 
the value of IoT within a smart city is true again, tight system integration, which is not easy. And it's become a system of system engineering, again, challenge. On the standard side, uh, this was recognized when you reach a certain level of, again, of maturity. And the Joint Committee for IT, which is called GTC1, for ISO and IEC, made a study group to look at it and concluded that there's a need for standard. And the report there is available online. You simply type that on Google and you'll find the report. And a working group was created. And again, uh, the working group has what we call terms of reference. And the basic foundational thing you do is you start with agreeing on the vocabulary. It looked mundane, but if two people cannot communicate about a topic, uh, efficiently, you have a problem to start with. So a standardized vocabulary, and after that, you move to the level to a standardized framework or architecture. And this is what they're working on. There's a project going on, and still at working draft, and we move to what we call the committee draft within a few months. Now, uh, there's a lot of things that can be looked at when uh, we standardize, again, architecture or framework. What you have there, and it's not the one they're talking, it's very standard layer diagram architecture, where you have at the lower level, if you want, uh, the edge, uh, all the actuators, uh, the sensors, smart or less smart, and the tags. And then you move to connectivity, edge computing, and you know there's a new name for edge computing. It's called fog computing, as opposition to cloud computing. And then after that, all the data that has to be accumulated, that has to be uh, processed, and the pre-processing is done at the edge. And after that, the application, which are normally in the cloud, and embedded into process and application. Very standard layer diagram. And then those architecture can become a bit more complex when we look at the application and the functional level there. And I won't go through that. But again, this, when these kind of things get standardized, you get better communication, but also products can become to be positioned. And you can be, start having a market, and you can put in those diagrams their standard protocols and move on. So this is what's required to create an efficient market. And there's a lot of work to be done there. Now, another thing that's maybe of interest to people, testers, smart mean software. In some case, a lot of software. Which bring us, all these things, to the other side of the coin. Talking about the positive side, but there's another side when you use technology, and you use technology that has a lot of software, as we know. First thing, interconnection through the internet. Internet, as you know, is a dangerous place. There's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of bad people lurking around. And you may have things, this cartoon is a bit, this slightly exaggerated things. If I read it there, the toaster has been hacked into thinking it's a blender. But there's a reality behind that. I mean, all those things interconnected through the net mean that they're exposed to, uh, I would say, some dangers in, in being hacked. So risk, IT bring risk. There are risks related to IT like any other technology. And it's been recognized for a long time. My best place to go there is the Risk Digest. And you can see it's been operating for a long time, since 1985. Is that? And uh, it's been updated. And if you want to find nice horror stories about misuse of IT or projects that go wrong, you go there and you can find a lot. It's a good source of uh, inspiration about this. Doesn't mean that you don't do anything. You must simply be, when there are risks, you must find, be, recognize those risks and then find ways to mitigate those risks. Now, nice stories, and again, I was talking to people in the insurance industry. You heard about this one, a fridge, an intelligent fridge. There are some out now, they're still expensive. That was ACK to, uh, again, generate spam. This story went around. At the end, the story was a false alarm. 
But think about it. What do you have into an intelligent refrigerator? You have a computer, an operating system, an application, and you hook that to the net. You could do that. It could be hooked like another PC if it's not protected. Other one, another uh, nice story. I don't know how many of you have cameras at home, but you all have one on your PC, probably. I don't know if you do like me. With the, I have a nice little thing that I the camera on my laptop when I don't use it. But essentially, uh, the story there was a, a young couple that had a baby monitor, and then it was hearing some noise from the baby room and went to see, and the camera turned over and started insulting them. So the camera had been hacked by a hacker, a very malicious hacker, essentially. So those nice cameras that you buy, that you hook to the internet, can be hacked, essentially. Pacemaker. Now, apparently it will be very difficult to do so, but it's bringing us now to medical devices. If I get the things, a pacemaker can be a thing and can communicate. It's very good to have a pacemaker where you can upgrade the software without having to open again, make an operation. Now, essentially, in theory, it could be ACK. Uh, think about all those other devices now that we're will have on our body. Uh, some of them are passive, like, uh, like uh, nobody else. I've had this fitness tracker with, on me that collect a lot of data, but other may be more sophisticated. And in the old days, we we're talking about a personal area network. Nowadays, we talk about extension of the Internet of Things to our body. So again, there are issues there. Now, things can get much more serious this was a test done in 2007, nine years ago. And you know, you have a lot of generators now that have a lot of embedded code. And for maintenance purpose, what do you do? You hook them to a network. Could be the open internet. And this test was done to see, was it possible if you hack a generator to destroy it, to disable it? And look at what happened. So you don't need to be a mechanical engineer to guess that probably the act was, uh, in a sense, missing with the timing of the flying wheel of the generator to get a situation like that. I think it's that. But nevertheless, it's showing that uh, you can have serious consequence if some of those devices are tampered with. And temper, again, the, uh, you have to be careful. Whoever temper with the generator knew what he was doing, he or she was doing. It's not necessarily easy. But it's a thing to keep in mind. So it's bringing us to all this industrial domotic. Internet of Things is already there. At my university, we have an intelligent building. A lot of things are controlled. That's only passive sensor from, uh, the, again, the system. And I can tell you, uh, there's a possibility to uh, cause some havoc. Uh, think about, at least in our climate, uh, when it's very cold in winter, minus 20, minus 30, it's not very good if the heating would stop in a large building. It can have a big impact. Uh, and insurance people reacted when I mentioned that. So industrial domotics mean intelligent building, it's also mean also controlling the production, uh, the factory itself. And there's incidents that are reported and not reported according to some of the website there. Some of those incidents, when you go to the list, seem minor, but it does happen. And uh, this is an, an example, I won't read through it. You can find it through the web. But, uh, and I have some nice juicy story there. But essentially, uh, those incidents uh, can have serious impact. Uh, there was, again, there, did not happen, but there was vulnerability that were found in generic controller that you can find in oil rig, water plant, and other infrastructures. And those could have been exploited in one way or the other. Uh, this one was more serious. This one, a German steel factory, and some of the equipment in the production line was destroyed by hackers. And what's interesting is that the hackers came in through the administrative network 
using social engineering. And what happened there is that the network for the administrative network was not isolated from the network that was in the factory. So they could get it, sneak into there and do some damage. So much more serious there. And again, uh, another one, in this case, some gas station that were using an embedded controller. And what's special about that, I mean, it could have an impact, is that the vulnerability was a backdoor. When people develop, again, systems, testers and developers will have a backdoor to do testing, and the backdoor was not closed when it was put in production. So you had those, all those controllers in the field that had the backdoor, and again, this were, these devices were not up upgradable through the network, which is the case of many old devices. So again, a vulnerability that was there that could have been exploited, and probably there are a lot of them. Smart cars, talking a lot, but already cars have certain degrees of smartness. A lot of software, and they're getting more and more interconnected to the internet. So you had this case there about uh, doors that could be unlocked at distance, and it's still there. Uh, you have, uh, there's been, uh, again, uh, it was reported from some car that uh, you could hijack again uh, the uh, car uh, locking mechanism. Uh, there was, again, uh, oh, this one was a good one, uh, taking control of a car through music and a CD. Uh, look far fetch, but you could guess that, uh, again, uh, when you have a car players and the network are not isolated, uh, you could find a way to pass some binary information to an analog player. But very far fetch, but still interesting. Uh, another one that made a lot of noise and uh, the, it generated a recall, and I have a Jeep, this model, so it was recall. But luckily in Canada, it was, uh, the Jeep was not hooked to the cellular network. But again, what you had there were people taking control through the cellular network of uh, driving a vehicle and taking control of the steering, the brakes. So very serious uh, security issue. And uh, as you could guess, uh, it made a lot of uh, bad publicity. Now, Car, developing a car nowadays is developing software. The car industry started to realize that many years ago. I think about 10 years ago, I went to a quality conference uh, that was in Munich, that was, uh, again, and its sponsors were the German car industry. Because developing a car is developing software. And there's a lot of software in a car, and very important. And now, car itself as an embedded network, it's a system of system, and you need to think this way uh, when you see it and when you develop it about security, about this. Uh, and uh, put it there, uh, again, 100 million lines of code in a car. Probably in there you have the entertainment system that take a lot of that. But you do have a lot of processors that are there with their own embedded code. And those processors, uh, if you have a lot of code in there, mean you have bugs, you know. There's always bugs in software. And some of these bugs can be more serious than others. Cars generate also a lot of data. They will be hooked on the net. And uh, this data may be two ways. And the data itself can be used to control the car after that. We talk about smart transportation about uh, autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicle, about uh, uh, the car reacting to the road condition and the road reacting to the cars that are there, it can get very complex. Now, uh, building management system, this was an experiment made by Google. Again, being able to penetrate the system, find out uh, the, uh, how the system work, and then be able to act on it and the patch, again, uh, the uh, problem that were there. This is to the point now that you have companies that are selling their service. I found this one there, there may be others. So they're selling their service to protect, again, industrial domotic and building domotic system. 
And it's interesting to see there how they sell it because they're talking about the number of incidents that are happened and then about the different type of facility and the impact on the business that you can have. I mentioned the fact that uh, when you cut the heating into a building and it's very cold outside, it's not very good. If you mess with the ventilation system, you can have an impact on the business, etc. cetera. So uh, it, there is now, it's becoming to be now a business. And again, when we talk about security, we talk about what? You need to test for it. So challenge is that there's a lot of different type of attacks that can happen. And those attacks, you can make, take control, you can steal information, and you can also disrupt services. And there'll be more and more of these vulnerability as we get more and more of the internet of things that's deploy and more integration of the systems. So uh, there's some basic principle in IT security, and uh, I will go through that very fast, but the key thing that you all know is you need to take an holistic approach, which means, uh, and, uh, and uh, the other thing that I'll talk about is the law of Pareto that apply because sky is the limit in IT security. You cannot have absolute security. So first thing that I mentioned was it's not a paperwork issue. You may laugh about it, but there's a lot of people, a company I met, oh, we have this amount of procedure that we write about security, conform to this standard. Yeah, but what about the real thing itself? Now, in security, like in testing, there's a limit to the return of investment. It gets asymptotic with time. First few things will pay a lot, and after a while, you'll get very smaller incremental change that can be significant. And in a sense, this means that there's a zone where if you don't do it, you're fully negligent. And at a point in time, you're beginning to do a, be in a risk management zone. How much you should invest, which risk you should accept. Now, in some case, the risk can be quite minimum if it's a safety critical system or if it is mission critical. Uh, up to a point. Another point, at a level, you can live with a certain amount of risk and be reactive in your environment. So it's coming back to what the requirements are. And when we deal with complex systems that use IoT, you can see that you're talking about a lot of different vector of attack, many layers of software and system that you have to look at. It's a real system engineering approach. So guess, think about smart city. I mean, smart cities for the moment, you read a lot about them, but there's not a lot of very advanced system integration. It's coming. So if all those things that we're writing about are implemented, you'll have this to talk about from a security point of view without being a security expert. Now what you have are concepts that are holistic, like it's a nice buzzword, but I like it. It came from a Forrester, an IT consultant. It's called Zero Trust Architecture. And what you have there is, again, very general principle that you apply. So everything must be secure, regardless of location. No backdoor, things like that. Access control, again, and then when you talk about information, the need to know basis, it's, temp it's very basic, but when you read about uh, Mr. Manning and uh, Wikilink and Mr. Snowden also, those people were able to get access to a huge amount of data because you did not have a need to know approach. You say simply, I have the security level, I can read everything there, not be limited to what you need to know. So this was a very basic principle that was not made. And then the other thing, very basic principle, you never trust anything. You always verify. You log, again, keep logs of everything that happened. And this can apply to embedded systems also. And again, this is, again, when you think about network, you design your network thinking about security also, not simply as a patchwork design that's done by accident. Now, I won't go very far uh, there. It's meaning a segmentation, but think about this. A car has many components. Should you have a segmented network also in a car? 
isolating the entertainment system from uh, more critical subsystems. Same principle there. Firewall. Now, again, this is an image to explain to people that are not technical what a firewall is. Uh, I mean, you want to keep the bad things out and have the nice right information coming in, the very basic thing. Now, firewalls can be put anywhere, not only in an IT, internal IT network. You have some on your PC. The moment you hook something on the internet, you should have a kind of firewall that's there, at least a filtration in there. So, in a sense, uh, again, uh, it's a very basic, again, tool that should be used. And uh, I was showing that to, again, insurance people and other people. Uh, I was CIO from, of my school for the last five years. And uh, we moved from a uh, less intelligent firewall to a new generation firewall. And we found out that we were blind. And one of the things that was even more visible is how many attacks we had the moment we put a server and expose it to the internet, the university huge amount of attacks and probing that was done. And I don't show there the apparent country because I know, you know on the internet, things are not as they appear. You don't know where they're coming from. But it is a reality. The moment you put something, you expose it to the network, the internet, it will be prob. Some people will come in, uh, robots, and will try to see if there are some vulnerabilities, if there are ways to get in and see what it is. So. Moving on, again, network, a zero trust architecture, the network is segmentation. And logging and layers of securities. In the case of IoT, there's a technology that may be able to, uh, again, make an IoT environment more secure. Uh, I'm not an expert in it, but it's called blockchain. Blockchains, it's a technology that's used in the bitcoins for Bitcoins, but it has a lot, there's a lot, uh, it's still very fluid and there's a lot of type of blockchain implementation that are, exists or are in development as such. And essentially, what you want to find is to find a way to, so, so that device that you put on a network, first, when they register themselves uh, there, you can authenticate that they are the right, they have the right to authenticate themselves. You want those devices to be able to do transaction independently, and uh, in a secure way, and you want those devices to, and one of those transactions is to be able to get software upgrades that are not malicious. And this is, uh, blockchain can bring, uh, make this happen. And uh, as you can see, you were talking registering device, authentication of users, connecting to barter, power, and also do transaction. IBM uh, with uh, Samsung did a trial of a uh, blockchain platform from IoT uh, earlier this year. And if I can quote uh, from at least the report on the report that I read, uh, Samsung, I'm not sure if it was a fridge or a washing machine, was able to order through the blockchain new supply independently and autonomously. But essentially, uh, we're talking about this kind of machine-to-machine -machine interaction done in a secure way. Now, security is not the only issue. We're talking about software-intensive system, and this is a very recent one that, uh, I mean, may make you laugh, but uh, a pet left Hungary as a smart feeder, feeder breaks, excuse my English. But essentially, uh, the owner of a smart pet feeding device called PetNet were told to feed their pet manually after a server problem. Stop at the device. And this I found really amazing. The seller of the service said that you always had to have a manual backup for smart system. It's not very good for marketing, isn't it? Selling those systems. Now, the key thing there that you can ask yourself, you can see there, this device, the system was dependent on the back office. Server broke down, cannot do anything. So first thing, why no redundance on the server? I mean, you expect to have a bit more redundance and reliability and resilient. And the other thing, you would expect the autonomous device to be a bit more autonomous. 
I mean, uh, it could still go move on uh, on a pre-programmed basis and do things uh, that, that are not being so dependent on the, again, on the server. So there's a system engineering issue there in the design there. But it's simply pointing out that you deal with software, software systems. Uh, they must be designed accordingly. They must be also bug-free. And uh, they must be so they must be tested and validated at all level. So IoT, again, in my mind, means complex software intensive system or system of systems. Now the conclusions, and again, these were conclusions for the insurance people, but you can say it's a bit evident. Uh, you can use a technology in a good or bad way, or again, another point is any technology can be used the right or the bad way, one way or the other. So thank you very much for your attention. Merci.